Now we have discussed about Italian and French. Now we go towards another very important one that is English landscape style. If we discuss all these three together that will cover our idea about the European landscape styles. English landscape styles. Location UK, United Kingdom. The period is 1600 to 1800 AD. Now you see there had been a change, there had been a kind of follow up. It's first Italian, then with a hundred year of lag, French landscape style begins and then with a, about a hundred year of lag, the English landscape style starts and it continues. Usually the English landscape style that we see in the history, the typical or the you know very identifiable in English landscape styles, they are between, they have been developed between 1600 to 1800 AD. But I can tell you one thing, all these landscape styles that we are citing, they are also undergoing gradual change and the evolution is still going on. It, it has not really ended. Now 1800 AD if you see, then it is not too far back, isn't it? At this particular century when you are looking at it, we will find that there are, you know, the urbanization has taken place human evolution has taken place, technology started growing. Of course, the technology has grown many fold from 1800 after, but still you will find that there are many signs of something which are or some elements which are being used today, but they can be contributed or attributed to the European landscape style example that we are seeing. Okay. The latitude is 52 degree north, the longitude is 1 degree west, the climate is temperate maritime. I would say compared to the other continents, the UK is a, it's that particular country is not very large. Of course, even Fran French landscape style where we find France is also not very large compared to other like Germany and all. But however, since the geographic location of that is such that it has created a temperate maritime clim climate. Mild with temperature not much lower than 100, uh, 0 degrees Celsius in winter not much higher than 32. So, if that temperature is from 0 to 32 is a normal temperature which our body can really adapt to, they are blessed. And the terrain low hills and plains that is in the central and southern part of it and uplands in the north and in the southwest. Okay. Now, so it is basically uplands and then basically plains and the low hills. What is the architectural style in this? Features, let us first focus out. They have adopted or rather they have experimented with hardscape and also softscape. The hardscapes which are non-plant elements, rocks, steps, such other which are non-plant that means non-vegetative elements that they have used for landscape design. They have used wooden barbers gazebos and walkways and meanders. Basically what they have done is they have now if you see the gazebos were created in different form in small form in the French landscape. Arbors which is an extension of trellis I have just explained that also came from the French. The pargolas which is also a mix of trellis arbors is a it has been I would not say borrowed it has been adopted from the French landscape styles. But one thing is very interesting the gazebo what we see in the landscape in contemporary landscape what we understand as gazebos is a structure with a roof and no walls around with the structural supports and the base. Our understanding of the gazebos and its creation we can always attribute this to the English landscape styles. Basically what happened is English, lands English landscape designers or I would say promoters of English landscape, they always created English landscape as a sort of you know more natural scenic views. If anybody wanted to experience the English landscape, they have to come out, come out of the house, not like what you saw in French landscape that you stand on your terrace, stand on your balcony stand on your window and you see the whole garden. No, in the English landscape it is slightly you know different from this kind of landscapes and that has given us distinct identity to the English landscape. Of course, there are examples 
where English landscape is uh, almost a true copy of the French landscape. I am not citing those examples because citing the same thing which has been copied makes no sense. Here I am trying to highlight that what is the speciality of the English landscape styles which we always appreciate. That is what I am going to highlight. Here arbors with wooden arbors, pargolas that they have created, gazebos the structure that they have created in the midst of a greenery mainly for retreat in case there is a bad weather or poor weather or in case there is a, a resting time required for the people who are moving around in the gardens and they require a place to sit or if it is raining suddenly they want a retreat such kind of spaces for which the gazebo got generated and this gazebo which they made with stones and other structures has taken a different shape in contemporary landscapes with different kind of lightweight materials. I will show those examples later in some other lecture not I do not want to mix up. Okay. So, the gazebos has become I would say a contribution of the English landscape styles. Like hardscapes they also have softscapes they have created softscapes. Nowadays if you see that we always talk about hardscaping and softscaping in the landscape more of hardscapes makes a landscape less natural and more of softscape makes it more natural. What English landscape style has offered to us is this like formal planters. So, they made different formal planter groups and they had raised ornamental pots. These ornamental pots which are slightly raised from other parts and they are covered with bushes with colorful flowers that gained popularity. In fact, I have seen that this particular idea is also now being emulated almost all over the Europe's wherever they have a opportunity they will put pots and originally they used to make it with stone pots and nowadays they are making with different kind of ceramic and others fiberglass and such kind of pots. So, the thing is material got shifted a bit, but the element we are discussing. So, the element remained okay. and the symmetry of color and strong lines of pathways that they have created. Landform very interesting here most often the English landforms are highly romantic. If you recall I was talking about the romantic classic and such things most often the English landforms are very romantic. What is this uh, landform? Landform is nothing but this earth surface that is profiled. Landform design when I will discuss in one of my lectures essentially there are different ways of using this particular activity in different terms. Some people call it landform, some say call it as ground form. So, it is basically the lands profile and English have really experimented with this kind of landform. Now, let me compare at this point with other landscape styles. Spanish landscapes we did not see anything of landform profiles, no experimentation of landforms. Chinese they created the landforms as naturally as it is available. Japanese have created the landforms which in a very low key it is not landforms in profiles, but they given different shapes irregular shapes. Mughal made it very very rectilinear flat like carpet may be terraced at different places in Kashmir. Italians they did not really play with the forms in very small scales they played with a rolling meadow and then to the next to the next to the next like tires or terraces. French made it very flat, English made a change. They created a profile on the land in such a way that it looks very natural, but mind it they have planned every square foot of it. This is the excellent part of the English landscape styles. Okay. It is consisting of romantic elements, then ponds with piers and bridges that they have integrated within it and then ponds with polygonal pavilions that they have integrated within it. So, that is the kind of landform the picture that it is we are showing here basically a small small mounds, troughs, crest and such things which they have created. Then water, they also have used the still water as a reflecting pool. Now, the surrounding landscape is green, there would be a building could be a building and also the at the foreground there is a water body which would reflect the building, the sky and other landscapes. Here we do see a little bit of you know similarity with the French landscapes. 
then the English landscapes are filled with eye catches. What is this eye catches? Let me tell you. You know, landscapists here, the designers here, they created some certain surprise elements in the landscape. That means you move from one place to another, suddenly you see something, you know, it catches your attention, or else you st go from one place to another, at a distance you see a certain element which catches your attention. This eye catches were basically the surprise that the ruler wanted to create for their visitors. And they used to invite, just like Italian garden, if you recall we, that we have also said mentioned this, that they used to the rulers or the owner of the gardens, they used to invite guests and visitors to enchant them with the kind of creation that they have done. English people have created eye catchers that you go from one place, suddenly between the you know groves, you see one element catches your attention. So, this eye catchers is one of the concept which English people have used. Contrary to Japanese, in Japanese landscape what they have done is, the Japanese they have created, they also created not eye catches, but they also created surprise, but in a very low key, gently you move from one path to one way to another by meandering paths or whatever and you get a kinesthetic effects where your whole body responses gets activated or reacts with the kind of things that you do see in front. But here it is very deliberate that you are made to walk through certain paths, then suddenly something will be exposed to you. That is what is the eye catches. So, it is a concept. Gently rolling ground and water, this is really a true contribution of the English landscapes. Whenever you, if you try to create any landscapes, we can always emulate any, but when you go for rolling grounds or water, you have to plan for it. You have to technically plan for it. The landform has to be designed in such a way taking into conjunction of landform and the drainage together. These aspects I will discuss in some other lectures for in technical terms. At this moment we are focusing on the history and what we have learned from the history. Woodland background with clumps of trees and outlier groves. That means, just like Japanese landscape, you have the foregrounds and others and you also have the backdrops. Here that they are the backdrops used to blend with in Japanese landscape the back, uh, or Chinese landscape the backdrop used to blend with the nature as if it is natural. Here they deliberately cover it. Here I would say that whatever they are doing for this landscape purposes of course, they also had a very strong functional requirement of that that was a security. If you remember that for Mughal gardens when I was discussing they had the high walls and the high walls before that in the foreground they had the large trees essentially they were all for security and same is here. If you have seen that in English landscape they have got the very strong groves, please do not think it is only for the beauty. No, it is also for the security and beyond that there may be something which is protecting the whole you know whole area, whole region. So, it is very functional and the English landscape contains a lot of you know, different number of romantic elements. The gardens built in a massive scale. The gardens not full with not like French or Italian. The gardens which are not having too many elements, gardens which is very smooth with a smooth transition from one kind of elements to another kind of elements gently rolling from the ground to the water. You have a chance to you know walk over the grass of the landmass sloping gradually down very close to reach close to the uh, water body and then you can even touch the water which is not there in French landscape. In French landscape the water body was a very definite, very strongly maintained water body. Here in English landscape styles it became really humane. This humane aspect which I was mentioning in my earlier lectures that in this landscape styles you have, you almost feel that you are at home within this particular place. So, the landscape is meant for you and you are the user of this particular landscape contrary to French and Italian. In French and Italian you are only a viewer, you are seeing it, ruler is the owner. Here in the English landscape style as if you own this, you belong to this place and you possess this particular area and you feel free to walk. This is what is the most important part of the English landscape style which should not be missed. The characteristics again here, now focusing on this, they have lakes they have created lakes. Look at these lakes, these pictures, 
do not they look like a natural lake? We can ensure you they are not natural, they are man made, they have been created very, very deliberately. This deliberate creation of the landscapes uh, or the water bodies, you know, very nicely designed, but constructed in such a manner it looks like natural. This is one of the interesting and most important part of this particular English landscape styles. What happens is why we are learning these historical examples when we get an opportunity to design a landscape. Then in that case, we will decide at the discretion of our requirement of the design that which kind of landscape we can emulate. It is not necessary that you have to just make a rubber stamp of different kind of landscapes in your own one piece of landscape that you are working on. No, the idea is which landscape suits the best for the kind of purpose that you are trying to serve. Because if you remember that our def in the definition I have said that every landscape design must have a purpose. So, this purpose, whichever purpose you have that based on that you will select what kind of historical styles you can emulate. Okay. Here see all these edges are meandering irregular, they have deliberately kept it, so that it looks natural. So, in the English landscape though everything is highly constructed, but they look so natural. And often we also had the pathways leading to you know that you know from one particular part let us say from one particular structure you might have a pathway leading you know through the rolling you know uh, mounds and all that and leading to the water. So, that is the surprise kind of things that they have really created and this is interesting. In this I will just cite one example if you look at where I am focusing at with my arrow here cursor arrow here you know this is technically what is called gazebo. In the whole landscape you will find in this particular picture, in the whole landscape you find green vegetation and the water and suddenly a place of retreat which is an architectural element, but it is not so dominating that it overshadows the entire landscape. This is the excellent part of the English landscape styles in which suddenly a structure, a small structure which becomes a small element in the overall naturalness, but very, very functional. This is what was is the gazebo. But later on I will show you what different forms of gazebo people are building nowadays later in some other lectures. Rolling lawns, same picture I have used here for two reasons. The first picture, the same picture you have seen in the other one in which you have seen the water body, irregular edged water body. And in this I am citing again the same picture to show that how the green lawn gradually rolls down to the water and gives access to the common people and that is the excellent part of the English landscape styles. Here look at this the almost flattish green leading to the water body here and ultimately you know almost merging with the water body. Now, this is what is the interesting part. Okay. Tree grooves now another set of elements if you really compare means if you rerun my this uh, presentations over and over again you will see if you start from the Italian then come to French and then come to English you will find that Italians have played with the greens, but they are as if it is too mechanically placed, too mechanically done. French have played with the same greens also very mechanical, very geometric, very patterned, very symmetric, but English have played in a different role. They have used this green in a different manner. What they have done is they have brought the green as if the whole area is naturally green, but of course since you are dealing with the larger spaces in such cases some bit of geometry will come in place like an example here the pathway. If the pathway is straight naturally there has to be a straight edge which will make a very strong geometric perspective no doubt about it, but look at the plantations which also has to be at the same distances on this side as well on this side, but if you look at the whole of this particular frame this pathway never gives a jerk visual jerk and this kind of geometry never gives a visual jerk as a strong geometry. Rather in the whole picture if you see the green is dominating this is what English people have done it. This picture I have shown here essentially to show that they have you know at places very geometric paths, geometric plantations, but most often they have made it very very natural. So, they have both the examples in their landscape styles. Here these are groves that they have created in between and then a water body and the grass lawn at the base. This if 
So this picture is taken from the top. If suppose if you stand on this particular line, on this particular level, then you will find the water body surface, water surface you will see very uh, scantily and then the large vegetations on the either sides, which makes you feel almost you are in the midst of a forest, but well regulated forest. Then sculptures. The sculptures were used by Italians, sculptures were used by French, sculptures also have been used by English. They have used the sculptures very strategically placing it. They have all these sculptures, each sculpture has something to depict, maybe historical or mythical or religious or whatever, something to depict, some philosophical issues. But the thing is, they are very strategically placed in the landscapes so that it you can view it from a distance. So, sculptures is not here in English landscape, the sculptures are not placed in such a manner that you can you just come close and suddenly you see and get a surprise. No, you can see very strategically that from there you can see a sculpture, from here you can see another sculpture, gradually walk towards this. When I will discuss about in the next lectures, the user's behavior, I will highlight the principles behind this. They have done it historically. I will try to explain to you how methodically and technically and principally they should be viewed. Then the grottoes. Grottoes are nothing but a kind of caves as the picture depicts. This grotto has now become almost an integral element in any of the you know religious uh, places like churches and all. This is a cave kind of places which they have introduced. Grotto was not element anywhere else. So, grotto was introduced by English and these caves are used for different purposes. Here the purpose is it can be a retreat, but this is not gazebo minded. The gazebo is something a structure with no walls around, almost no walls around, it is colonnades, columns or such fences. Grotto is one of the caves that you have a space within where you can sit, so they have the seating or you can have a very deep caves like this. So, these are all grottoes which are essentially used for as hideouts hideouts for the users just to sit there you know be out of the sight of other people and relax or chat or you know just communicate with others or enjoy the beauty of the nature. So, these are the grottoes which they have built. Now then other elements I explained about these grottoes of different shapes or different forms then topiaries. If you recall topiaries I discussed when I was talking about the Italian landscape styles. In fact, historically if, I, if you go chronologically of course, the topiary must have been developed by Italians first and the topiary is also we have seen in different forms in the French landscape as well, not in so strongly, but English people they have used it. And in our country also in India also we have seen historically in the old gardens which are now almost vanishing. Uh, I have seen examples of topiary in many of the public gardens which are created by the authorities or the government or federals. Now this concept is I would say borrowed from Italy, fine. Next tea house is also one of the elements, but do not confuse this with the Japanese tea house, tea rooms, because Japanese tea house has a rituals they have some religious or some kind of rituals or some kind of you know uh, some rituals associated with it. Here it is not, it is only a place of retreat. Here English people have used this for you know relaxing there, moving away from their home, being in another structure for tea purposes. Then ponds, ponds, lakes and such other, other elements, pavilions. This I would say very much resemble what I was trying to talk about gazebos. These pavilions were there in Chinese landscape as well if you recall. These pavilions were there in Japanese landscape as well. These pavilions were there in Spanish landscape as well. So, the thing is the pavilion as an element is not an introduction by English, but it is the element that got introduced by English which got a name called gazebo. This kind of pavilion it is in a small garden, this kind of structure with a little bit of made of stones and others, stones and bricks and all others in a large landscape where 
basically a place of retreats which are the gazebos. Sometime even the you know tea houses also became such kind of pavilions, it all is a matter of scale. Then another very important element sham ruins, look at the picture and try to recollect this must have been one of the ruins of an old structure. Here lies the real catch of their introduction of something new in the elements. What they have done, English landscapes, landscapists, they have created this, a newly constructed structure looking like ruins. This is the interesting part which we have learned from the history. You create something looks like a ruins and construct it and grow it and maintain it in such a way as if it is a ruins. So, this is called sham ruins. This structure is quite recent, it is not the old structure ruins and then to make it or give it a look of the oldness, what is done is all creepers and all other things are very well planned and then they are planted at the base and allowed it to go surfacing on this particular structure, so that it looks like as if the old ruin against which all other creepers which are rooted to the structure and growing. This is one element got added by them. Then comes bridges. The bridges here, this structure you have seen this is a very common element. The bridges we did not see much in very much in Italian and French, because they had so much of grandness that the idea of the bridges did not exist. The bridges we have seen in Chinese, we have seen in Japanese, we have also seen in some parts of the Spanish, but the bridges become a very strong element in our English landscape style as well. Then the statues, this structures, the statues they have introduced here. Now, we look at an example. The best example that could be cited for English landscape styles is the Chatsworth house in Derbyshire, England. Okay. It has been built in 1549, but interestingly this particular example which I am citing here is still continuing and it is still evolving over time. See the first is, it is very famous for its rich history and also the modern world works. Basically what happened is in this particular landscape styles you know, you will find that the technology has started coming in and the technology which has aided different materials like glass and other frames they had been used, the fountains had been used with more better technology. Okay, the, okay, now let us first see how is the profile of this particular garden. It is not very large, it is about say 43 hectares. If you now compare with the French lands Versailles that we had shown, it was a huge landscape. In this the landscape is not very large, it is small. Okay. The famous waterworks that you know that we found in this is about 300 year old casket. And also the squirting willow tree fountain, this willow tree fountain I will explain, but let us hold on. Let us see the other parts. Okay. Now, over 8 kilometer walks with rare trees, shrubs, streams and ponds, that is what the whole landscape is. So, the Chatsworth is you know, if you have to really experience Chatsworth, you have to move around the entire areas through the paths that the designers have evolved over. This is how it looks like. Let me get all its details in the pictures here. Okay. It has the early garden, then it has a sixth duke and Paxton, then we have the modern garden and then we have the sculptures in the garden. Now, this is how the whole Chatsworth landscape style can be understood. If you see in terms of time, 1540 the early garden and now it is it has gone even till today. What is interesting in this is it has evolved over time. Of course, we have seen that almost all the gardens have evolved and what chronologically we have found is most of all the European gardens have almost evolved over say about 200, 300, 400 years. English garden is still evolving. Quickly going through different elements of this early garden, there is a formal plot to the south with south with ponds and fountains, very formal. Then hill to the east 
this was in a terraced that means some formality formal parts and some terrace part. High wall enclosed a deer park now animals came in and nowadays if you see that many of the public gardens also has a component which is a deer park or animal parks or zoo that means the gardens and the zoo almost you know adjacent to each other. This is the kind of thing so the animals started coming in into this in very formal form. Classical style with almost the Italian and French influences that was there. So, as I said earlier that the essential or interesting part of the English garden which I was trying to highlight is the rolling meadows, rolling, garden, rolling lawns and then leading to the irregular water body edges. These are the excellent part of this, but there are examples where some part were just a copy or emulation of the French and Italian ancestral styles. But there are also different kind of pathways. The pathways are nothing but paths, different zones, but they had been cut to slopes and different paths. Okay. Other points like say in early garden, let us take this example, Salisbury lawns. If you look at this, it looks like a structure and then just in the foreground a landscape and then rest is flat meadow. Now, this lawn which is at the east of this is called the Salisbury lawn, Salisbury lawn which is about 2.3 hectares very flat resembles Italian landscapes. The canal pond and the reflecting pools they are also a part of it. The fountain is probably this is one of the highest fountain in, in Europe which at that point of time which was built. Now, the fountain was a part of the water body called great fountain and then the cascades the water cascading from one level to another. Look at the right side picture that the water is cascading from one to another. This cascading water which you also we have seen in Mughal gardens which are available in Kashmir. This cascading we have seen in Italian, this cascading we have seen in we are seeing in English gardens as well. So, the flowing water is one of the element that makes it very strong element of the English landscapes. All these were made essentially you know the cascading and then flowing water to create surprise to the visitors. This was very deliberately made as I, I mentioned earlier that objective of the ruler was to enchant the visitors and show their sense their own sense of creation. So, the cascade was for surprise for delight and such things. So, it was almost a sort of you know I would say a demonstration of their sense of art or extravaganza in terms of creating landscapes that is it. The greenhouse the first duke's greenhouse this greenhouse the concept of greenhouse that we do use today essentially to protect the plants and they have also done it the same way. They because of the climate they wanted to create a proper environment for the plantations and for which the greenhouse was created. So, the greenhouse element as an element in the landscape which you do see in many of the botanical gardens in our country and also all over the world. But we feel this is a contribution of the English because we did not see really greenhouse in other landscape styles. So, this is appears to be a very strong contribution of the English landscape styles. Then early gardens continuing the Flores temple this particular pathway leading to the temple focused very well created. When I will talk about the plantations along the avenues at that time I will highlight the profiles. I do not want to switch from here to the profile plantations, but what they have done is they have created the plant paths and along which they have the tall trees which are very focused very geometric and leading to a visual focus. Then comes the grotto house which I have already discussed and then willow tree fountain this is one thing which I want to draw your attention to. You know the idea or creativity goes to has no limit it is unbounded what they have done is you know they have created this artificial tree with the brass. So, they have made shapes of branches with the brass tubes 
and then they have welded, soldered, and made a brass tree, made of brass tubes. And then they have started flowing water through this. So what happens is when it works, and the entire water is flowing through all the edges and the ends, this splinter out just like you know the spouts, and then they look like a willow tree. And this is one, you know, artificial tree which looks like you know this is a replication of something. When I'll talk about the unity in my principles, I will highlight this particular point. If you still at that time keep in mind that there is something called unity here, it is a matter of you know attention, catching attention. You remember we, I talked about eye catchers. This is something like eye catchers means people get you know people have a wow feeling once they see this and they say wonderful creations. But this is not natural. Water is natural, but the whole concept of making a tree of some other material and then allowing the water to flow through and looking like a willow tree is not natural. However, wonderful thing that has been you know gifted to us. Then six Duke and Paston, you know this is a time when they have created arboretum. You know, basically, it is streams, natural streams, or they all they have started creating. So originally, there are certain things in the English landscape which might have been almost a replica of French or copy of French, but gradually started getting a different kind of profiles. The case, the structure that they have created, which is again for protecting the plants. This is the place where they used to keep the plants for its germination for its growth, for its health check, for its you know propagations and then ultimately bring it down to the outside. You know this is this particular idea the case which like green, greenhouse is the contribution of English landscapes. Another thing which we have found in the example of the Chetworth is the coal hole and the tunnel. The coal hole and the tunnel in this what happened is you know basically they had a chariots that used to carry the coals through this particular tunnel and that became a part of the landscape because that used to pass through the large area. So the idea was that you know the horse drawn carts will bring the coal to this area and then ultimately small small you know uh, containers will carry this coals through. But this coal hole became an integral part of the landscape but it has not been really identified as an element that which is a must for English landscape. But of course in Chatsworth we have found this as an example. Other examples, great conservatory again the greenhouse, the glass house. The building was pretty long to 84 meter and 37 meter wide, it is pretty long 90 meter high. That means now technological evolution in terms of making large structures, large span structures had already started coming in. Now that got blended with the landscape and this has been put to use in the landscapes. Then is Pinatum. Basically you know these is the kind of landscape which they have created here if you see I will show you with respect to this here. You know different kind of coniferous plantations that they have placed over here. They created a, a kind of wilderness within the landscape. So when we see English landscapes, now we see that there is a blend of wilderness, groves, rolling meadows in slopes and the water bodies. That makes the true English landscape. So if you now try to ever create an English landscape, you do not try to emulate the French influence in the English landscape because English landscape gradually shifted from that very uh, very regimented design to the naturalness and that made it an excellent contribution. It is because of this when you want a kind of natural landscape that you want to create unless it is very much you know uh, I would say manicured like Japanese landscape then I would suggest that you can go for English landscapes which makes no more natural. And then the rock gardens and the strides, 
rock garden was also a part of or element of the Japanese landscape, but here what happened is this has gained its popularity by virtue of its naturalness. The rock gardens are created with naturalness. Even the rock gardens has undergone a tremendous evolution in technologically. I will discuss in other lectures, but here basically essentially as if rock outcrops, rock structures, water bodies, some vegetation that is how it is. And the vinery, this vinery that they have created, this has a different purpose. You do not consider this as a vineyards. This vinery was created essentially to shade the understory plantations for its protection. Basically, it is nothing but a kind of greenhouse with vegetation at the top. So, they got double benefits. First of all, they created a semi shaded zones below which the plants can be protected from the direct solar radiations and allow it to grow. And above that, along with that, you have the grapes. The modern garden in which here there had been some uh, very difficult kind of things that we have seen. See the hedges we have seen which are strongly used in the French pathways. Here they have used in English in Chatsworth example we do see they have emulated our building structures. This is almost like a dining table and a chair or say boundary walls, low height boundary walls. These ideas of hedges properly trimmed, geometrically trimmed, replicating boundary walls or the globes over the posts or tables, chairs, these are seen mostly in French and English landscapes. Looks a little regimental, looks a very geometric and many people have a contrary uh, you know opinion about it. Some people like it because of its excellent artwork. Some people do not like it because it looks so artificial. Display greenhouse. Now, this particular greenhouse has been created with a very technical uh, insights. For different seasons, the climate can be controlled within this. So, this has different climatic, three climatic zones essentially the tropical, Mediterranean and temperate. So, within this greenhouse they have that system in which different kind of climatic situations that they have created and within which they can you know grow the plantations. Then comes kitchen garden. This kitchen garden is almost a common element for any of the small small single story houses in our country and everywhere. Essentially these are all for vegetables which are edible. So, it is generally at the backyard. So, kitchen garden we started seeing from English garden style itself. And then the maze. This maze which is nothing but a labyrinth. In some cases you must have seen that these mazes are created with a little higher height and the kids if they are moving within the maze they cannot see the other uh, regions and that creates a kind of you know wonderful uh, hide and seek games generated within this maze. So, English gardens have shown us these examples. And then summer house. You have shade, semi shade during summer. Then modern gardens quickly going through it. Cubic which is you know a long overgrown area below the canal pond. So, basically what happens is they have allowed this the long overgrown is basically vegetation has been allowed to grow along this water bodies and such areas. So, if there is a canal which is natural and that they have regulated the water and allowed the vegetation to grow over this particular areas. Ravine and Azalea Dale. The ravines are see essentially what is ravine? Ravine is basically the larger sizes of channels which are flowing all the waters from the regions and ultimately leading to the river. Now, those ravines they have created. Ravines is a natural phenomena, it is a geomorphological results, but here they have deliberately created the ravines to give natural look. All these are experimentations worth mentioning. Then comes the rose garden specifically for different kinds of roses and then the sensory garden. This is one of the styles which many of the architects or landscape architects are following very very you know ritually. They are trying to create the gardens of five senses. English garden styles in Chatsworth we have seen this example. They first introduced the idea of this uh, gardens of five senses all the senses are you know through different means different designs that they are generating. In uh, I think in Delhi you have in South Delhi we have a place very close to Saket where we do see 
the you know it's they have deliberately mentioned this place called gardens of five senses. So, idea is that you create such kind of ambience. This is I would say emulation of the English gardens and then serpentine hedges they created the hedges with a different kind of shapes. You have seen the hedges given you know uh, shape of the mazes and also these. So, basically if we now look back what have you learned from this. Let us go a little backward from English. In English landscape we have found that they have created kitchen garden, they have created rose garden, they have created gardens of five senses, they have made the gardens accessible to common people. Though historically English gardens have grown over ages more and more it has evolved and the all these places became a public property common property that means common people are allowed to use it enjoy it experience it more and more our entire constitutional system has come to that that even a common people has the right to see a common place or the natural spaces the landscape got gradually modified and English garden since it is very recent very latest in such cases we have seen that it has adopted this philosophy. If you look back earlier English gardens they were slight emulation of the French. French landscapes emulation of the Italian. At the same time the Mughal gardens grew. If I focus on this itself English gardens we have found that now contemporarily most of the people are no longer adopting French or Italian landscapes. Most often you will find since all our landscapes are public gardens or public places or public squares they are almost a replica or representation or a reflection of the English gardens current trends or the latest trends. If you go to the gardening styles of the houses kitchen garden has entered into the houses. This is one very interesting point to note that it has evolved over time historically. If you follow these two series of lectures which I have focused or rather dedicated for his you know understanding the history of landscapes run it repeatedly. S listen to my deliberations repeatedly see the pictures give time see the pictures try to understand what I have tried to communicate to you. One thing is very sure landscape originally was for the rulers either a single person or his family or friends. Landscape has now changed to a different dimension. Now, the landscape is for everybody, common people, anybody. So, landscape has entered into public places and English garden reflects that, that within that English landscape period time only the landscape came out of the individual ownerships to the public ownerships. And when you will be planning for today or tomorrow it is all the more democratic planning that will come into. So, that is what we have learned through the entire history. I hope you have enjoyed this. If you have any further clarifications to seek please feel free to write in the forum. Let your question be very brief and to the point so that we can understand your question well and also give you the feedbacks very crisply we do not want to overload the forum with too much of answers or too many questions. If you are very focused ask your question very briefly and to the point and we will try to answer your questions to the point. So, that your points are clear and our objective is fulfilled. What lies ahead? In the next series of lectures we would like to discuss about the various behavioral issues associated with the landscape design. Let us wait for it. Thank you for joining this. See you again.